to the Bean Ninjas podcast, where you get an all-access pass to see what happens behind the closed doors of a fast-growing global bookkeeping and financial reporting business. Hey, everyone. On this week's episode of the Bean Ninjas podcast, I chat with Jade Green from Business Engineered. She's got a really interesting story around scaling up a business that ultimately didn't make her happy and the change in direction that she took. And we also had a good chat about team building and company culture and having happier humans in the workplace and outside. We also have a chat about personal branding and the way that she's built her personal brand, as well as helping others to do that. So enjoy the show. Hey, Jade, and welcome to the Bean Ninjas podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. I've been following your content on LinkedIn and Facebook for a while, and it's really nice to have you on the show for a chat. Yeah, it's been a while that we've been uh, going backwards and forwards online and never actually catching up properly. So let's start with a little bit of your backstory. I know you've got a number of different things on the go, but why don't we start with your corporate transition into your first business? Ah, well. That's a funny story when you say my first business. My first business was actually at 21. So I had a <laughs> a modeling and promotional agency and accidentally ended up with a dressmaking business on the back of that as well from 21 to 25 and a bit before getting into corporate recruitment life for 13 years. So got into headhunting and recruitment. I was your quintessential Pitt Street worker in Sydney wearing the three-piece pinstripe man suit and my black dark frame glasses toting my Prada bag and my shiny, shiny paint and shoes, doing the grind under the fluorescent lights like up to 20 hours a day. And that was good times, right? <laughs> I really was doing all the should at that stage. You know, the, the should have the office in the financial district of Sydney and 100 square meters and all the staff and the bright, shiny things and win all the awards. And so my business then, Velocity, was started. I had it for five years. And I think, you know, the entourage and the guys from the Entourage Growth Fund, they came on board about three years into me having Velocity. And I really thought that I was going to build this recruitment empire once that train started shuffling down the tracks, which was really strange because before I started Velocity, I said I never wanted to have a recruitment company after doing like nine years in the industry and that I was going to start it as a recruitment company. But my goal was always to win all that back, the actual recruitment arm to be about 15 to 20% of the business. And it was the means to the end. It was my way that I could get into businesses to really fulfill my mission, which was to be the world's largest enabler of humans that are happy at work. And I felt like the recruitment piece would be my door opener, how I could get in there and start helping them realize that they need to work on their culture and help them start recruiting the right people that will be in flow in their jobs and not miserable and how I could help individuals find the right job and not just take normal jobs. And that was just a square peg in a round hole because you just get swept up in it and then having investors come on board and then you know you get into the buying into what I call the rules of society, the bullshit rules of society. And I won one award and then, oh, we won another business award. Oh, let's get another award. And then it became that ego thing of building a business for the sake of winning awards and then getting swept up in the ego of all the other entrepreneurs that I'm surrounded by are hiring more staff and doing more things and expanding to more locations and all of the stuff. And I was miserable. I was a few things, end up with it going through a divorce as well, but that's another story. But I found out, I just looked at myself, I'm like, I'm not doing any of the things that I set out to do with this business. I'm writing a business plan around how I can win another International Women's Business Award when I fundamentally go against doing women's only things, which was weird. And I had to really have a good hard look at myself about what was going on. And Jack Delosa, who was my mentor at the time, suggested that I read two books, What I Know For Sure, by Oprah Winfrey and Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. So I did that. And due to a series of events that happened, I had an awakening reading Conversations with God and realized that this is where my power quote comes out from that 
I made my mantra, which is life is a choice. It is what I choose. And I had to realize that I had chosen to be exactly where I was and I had no one else to blame but myself. And if I wasn't being happy and it wasn't fulfilling me and I felt like there was something missing, then it was up to me to make the change. And so that was a catalyst. (laughs) And then I started reading more books and reading more books. And that led me to reading The Code of the Extraordinary Mind by Vishen Lakiani, who's the founder of Mind Valley. And so I read the code and I turned to my flatmate at the time and I said to him, I'm going to fly to KL and where their head office is and convince Vishen to license me in Australia so that I can come back and teach all of my clients the Mind Valley culture ways because like this is how we can make happier humans. And I believe that happiness is the greatest hack to productivity and profitability. And so if I can convince them of this and I've got the Mind Valley backing, then I'll be able to like, this is the key. I didn't fly off to see Vision straight away. And I went on a series of more spiritual awakening and searching and really some self-sabotage, to be honest, Meryl. If I look back, there was things I was doing that were self-sabotaging my business and the success of my business in terms of placing trust in people that I shouldn't have ever placed a trust in, just blind trust, because I wanted to spend, I needed to help my family and I needed to fly away and be out of my business. I just wanted to trust that they'd look after it so I could do what I wanted to do, which was spend more time up in Queensland with my family and help my sister. And I dropped the ball on it. And so that forced my hand into making some decisions. And my mentor said to me, the business is killing you. Stop flogging the dead horse. Like you hate it. And it's really making you absolutely miserable. Don't keep it for us. Like let it go. Do what makes your soul happy. And so I had to make a choice to let that go, to close it down. And I actually closed down everything. I closed down the business. I sold nearly everything I owned in Sydney, except for my beautiful bright orange sports car and basically a room full of things. And I went and started surfing again and found my joy. And then I started my sabbatical. Do you want me to take a breath now? And then... (laughs) Yeah, there is just so much gold in what you've talked about. And I was actually talking earlier today about how sometimes ego, as you mentioned, can get in the way of, of what our true goals are and we can get caught up in what our next revenue target is or how quickly other business owners are growing. And it's really easy to get swept up in that and lose sight of why you went into business. So I love that that you talked about that. And the things that you talked about and the happier humans line and also around everything being a choice, so personal responsibility. And I want to just dig into the investors side of things for a little bit. Mm-hmm. This is something we've talked about on the podcast and Beaninjas also has an investor and it does slightly change the dynamic around the decisions that you can make. So was that an uncomfortable conversation to have with your investors around you wanting to or shutting the business down? And how did that go down? Well, I was lucky that they could really see that I was not happy and they were in a different position as well. And so it was easy because he, Jack literally said to me, JD, it's killing you. <laughs> yeah. So the whole dynamic changed, like what we thought we were going to do and what they were doing at the time, there was a big shift in, um, in where we were both at really and what we wanted to do. And my behavior wasn't necessarily, it wasn't because they stated for something to do. It was my ego and it was me wanting to prove myself more and getting deeper and deeper into building a business that I didn't want to be in. And like there was certain things like obviously I had other advisors that sat on the board and they thought the best thing would be to keep funneling the stuff into the recruitment side of things and build that side of things and let's grow and putting more headcount on, more headcount on rather than doing the diversifying into the culture piece that I wanted to do. Mm. We kept growing the recruitment side and that was what was making me miserable. And because the nature of the recruitment game is super high stress, it's super high volume. It's a numbers game. There's no other way to skin the cat. Like you've got to make the calls and you've got to grind. Mm. And that was everything against what I wanted to build as an environment. Once you build your business and your reputation for paying clients, the being the company who's going to hire, you don't have to chase them anymore, which we were in an amazing place that we had more clients than we could handle. But in the nature of what we do, you have to get the candidates. So then it flips and then you're doing the grind of trying to call and find all the candidates. And that's the bit that's 
the tough bit. Yeah. So then what happened? So you then took some time off, had a sabbatical, and then launched these other businesses? Is that yeah. what that timeline look like? And tell me more yeah. about your sabbatical too. I'm intrigued. So I made the decision. There's so many layers to making the decision to step out of the recruitment business, but to step out of Sydney. And I bought my two sisters up. So they are like my daughters. And so they both live in Queensland. And one of my sisters was going through some health issues and she's a single mom. And I just started looking at my life after also going through the divorce and going, what's important to me? And when I looked at what was, and this is where Oprah's book comes back in, what I know for sure, I'd stopped surfing for 17 years while I built my first business or my first two businesses, then built two recruitment companies for other people and then built my recruitment company. And I'd stopped surfing. And surfing is what made me me. Like that's my meditation. That's my grounding. That's my, you get it. <laughs> it's my 100%. zen. Right? right? Great chat and, about surfing before the podcast. Yeah. And I almost got sidetracked and I almost had to, <laughs> I'll let you keep going. <laughs> and there's another point to that is I was feeding my masculine energy by playing football. Like not only playing football, I started an American football league for women in Australia. I started the only American football league for women in Australia and was doing it at the same time as running my recruitment startup. So I'm out there tackling things and banging shit and yelling at people. And then I'm playing national football, touch football, and that's super competitive and heavy. And I'm all up in this masculine energy. And that really wasn't serving me. And I wanted to go back to re-getting in touch a little bit with my feminine, um, but being more rounded. And I was feeling called to being back to my family. My nephews were growing up without me seeing them. My other sister got pregnant and I wanted to be around for the birth and to support her. And so there was all these decisions. What I didn't know what I wanted to do though was, okay, what do I want to do next? What business do I want to do? What do I want to do? And I was like, well, I love sport. Maybe I could be a personal trainer. Oh, I was a lifeguard. Maybe I'll go back to lifeguarding. Oh, firefighter. My best friend's a firefighter. Maybe I'll be a firefighter. <laughs> uh, and then I turned up with my dad and he's like, you're going to join the SWAT team or something, aren't you? And I'm like, oh, I've always wanted to be on SWAT team. <laughs> so these are like crazy ideas running through my head, right? But then I found a friend of a friend suggested that I did this business accelerator because he knew that I was a learning junkie and any chance to be in a training room, I'm there, throw me in. And although the business accelerator was designed more for businesses that have already got something going, being an accelerator rather than an incubator, I was like, ah, screw it. Count me in. When is it? Next week. Fine. Flying back to Bali. Let's go. So I went and I did the accelerator. And side note, I now facilitate that accelerator. <laughs> so I, I loved it so much that I now teach it. And during that, I uncovered, what do I want to do? And we looked at the end in mind. What's my ideal day? Who do I want to be? Who do I want to serve? Like who gives me the most joy? What's my genius zone? How can I serve best? And mapped this out over the two weeks and then sat down and went, who are the organizations that I respect the most in the world that are doing this, who already have a platform, who already have a client base that I could tap into because I'm changing fields, right? I've built a reputation for 13 years in headhunting and recruitment. I'm completely shifting gears. And I've decided that the thing that brings me the most joy was I always consulted and coached my clients. I just didn't get paid for it on the recruitment piece or on their employer brand or on their personal brand and how to build their businesses and helping them from startup stage to growth. And I do all that to help them so that they could recruit off me, but I only got paid for the recruitment. And I was like, but that's what brings me the joy, coaching and facilitating and training and having an impact. So I wrote down on the piece of paper that I wanted to align with Mind Valley. The book popped up again. Mind Valley and Entrepreneur Resorts, Entrepreneurs Institute, who was doing the course at the time. So I left that course on the Sunday and I flew to Barcelona to where Mind Valley was having their very first Mind Valley University so that I could go to a three day seminar with Neil Donald Walsh, whose book was the catalyst for my getting a divorce, basically, and changing my life. And at the very end of that month in Barcelona, I did a meditation session, a seminar called Becoming Extraordinary with Vision, who wrote the book. It closes with a six-phase meditation where you go through and you visualize your ideal life. So you do it, it's like you go through compassion, gratitude, forgiveness, ideal day, future visioning, and close it with a blessing. 
And in the future visioning, it's going to sound woo-woo as shit, Meryl, God. Uh, you sit down and you visualize, you meditate on what's your ideal day the next day. And my ideal day went like this. I'm going to wake up in the morning refreshed and not hungover because I'm not going to drink too much at the closing party tonight. I'm going to pack my surfboard bag easily because it's a nightmare and it's going to be smooth. I'm going to catch up with my friend Martin who's got a meeting with Vision in the morning and he's going to tell me what's my best way to pitch Vision to teach me the Mind Valley ways to bring it back to Australia and be the license. And then Vision's going to ask me to have dinner with him. And then I'm going to have dinner with Vision and I'm going to convince him to give me the rights to Australia. He closes the meditation. He stands up and he's like, so my wife, Christina, is flying off tonight and she's not going to be here tomorrow. And I'm wondering who would be interested in having dinner with me? And I'm like, I'm already there. And he said, and over the last two days, we've realized what we really need is to certify some trainers around the globe to really help take the School of Humanity to the streets and impact a billion people. So we're looking to license people in each of the countries. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Shut up and take my money. Oh. <laughs> So that started my Mind Valley journey. So the time frame from making the decision to wind up velocity and to make my move, I did that in February and this was in the June. So I did the iLab for Entrepreneurs Accelerator in the end of May and then flew off and did June in Barcelona. And I started my journey and started realizing what I wanted to do. That's when I started building. Life Engineered, which I've now flipped the name to be Business Engineered and made Life Engineered a product and started doing more and more training around how can I be of best service to the founders of fast growth startups that are starting to become conscious so that I can really, you know, fulfill my dream of being the world's largest enabler of humans that are happy at work and to help them to be able to create income so they can have an impact. That takes us through to now, which is exactly two years later. So I'm about to fly on Tuesday to Croatia for the third Mind Valley University city campus, which is going to be in Pula this year. Wow. And so it's almost like you've gone full circle and you are following that vision of producing happier humans. And it yes. wasn't possible in that first business, but in this new business, you've been able to find a way to work towards that. And so tell me more about what business engineer looks like and the life engineer product. And I know you have some other training products <laughs> in there as well. So yeah. who do you work with and how do you help them? Yeah, so I work with fast growth startups. So I usually work with the founders and directly. It's usually the people that their biggest problem is time, right? They don't have time to work on their business. They don't have time to spend with their family. They don't have time to live. They are just stuck in the grind. They're wearing too many hats. And they can't scale because they're the biggest iceberg in their business. Like they don't have time to train somebody else. They don't have time to recruit the right people. All of this is coming back. And so the reason why I flipped my product range at Life Engineered was the original one where I helped work with the founders on the six aspects that make them a five-dimensional human. So that's business, relationships, wisdom, health, adventure, and spirituality. But what I found was most of the people I serve, they can't even think about how they're going to work on their health and their relationship and their adventure and their spirituality until they've got their business at a stage that they're more comfortable to be able to step out of it. So being my genius, being recruitment and headhunting, I created the team engineered product, which is how teaching people how to attract, retain and maximize their human capital. So how to build an attraction strategy, an employer brand, so you can attract world-class talent, how to retain that talent in the business and how to maximize every human's potential within the business. So that's about helping them get into flow states, which led me to then going back to Entrepreneur Resorts and Entrepreneurs Institute to become a certified flow consultant and performance consultant because really getting to understand the personality types and how to get teams into flow to be able to make sure that people are happy. If people are in flow, they are happy, right? And if they're happy and in flow, they're more productive. And if they're more productive, they're more profitable, which then allows the businesses to scale. And therefore, the business owners can start looking at the other aspects of their life. That's why we flipped that. And then because of that, though, we started to find that, wow, the founders really need to 
increase their personal branding, not only for generating business so business is attracted to them and partners attracted to them, investors are attracted to them, but also so they can create an employer brand so talent is attracted to them. And someone shook me one day and they're like, you know, you're like the LinkedIn queen, right? And, you know, personal branding is your thing. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> really? I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, that's actually how my whole, that's how I actually got everything that I'm doing right now. It's my personal brand. I've gone from having 6,000 connections on LinkedIn when I closed Velocity to not even knowing what I'm selling, but keeping my brand alive and delivering a message over the two years and having 25,000 followers on LinkedIn. <laughs> so obviously that's where I serve as well now. And it all sounds like, holy crap, there's like a lot going on there. But believe me, they all interlink. And to really shine in each of them, you need to work on each of the elements. Yeah. And I, I understand it completely as a fan of myself, where you know that you want to work on these aspects of your life, but it's only when your business is at a certain level that you can do that. And I know the first couple of years of being ninjas, I had to make sacrifices so mm-hmm. that I could grow the business to the point to hire people to then be able to remove myself from some of the operations. So I think that's really clever that you've identified that. And if you can help people with their teams and with their systems and help the founders step out a little bit, then they can focus on these other things. And I had some questions for you around the attract, retain and maximize in terms Mm -hmm. of building teams. So if you were working, if you were going into a business to work with the founders and they haven't come from a, an HR or recruitment background themselves. Yes, they might have been a manager back when they were working as an employee. Mm-hmm. They probably don't have a lot of structure around their employee processes. Maybe they've got five to 10 staff. How would you approach going into fixings? Because there's probably a lot of yeah. gaps, people not in the right places, maybe the uh-huh. not right. So how would you, because there's probably a lot of things to fix. Where would you yeah. start? So one of the key things is often if we've been managers in business in corporate, we've managed one department or one division and they usually a similar personality type to us. And when we become a founder, like say you're an accountant, right? And you're used to dealing with detail oriented people and they're used to structure and process, but all of a sudden you're managing a salesperson and they're like, you know, they, they go by gut and they're running around and they're loud and there's shit everywhere and... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You don't even know what to do with them. And you don't know how to interview them. You don't know how to hire correctly because they talk you around in circles and they do the salesman thing on you. Where I would start is getting everyone profile tested and understanding what the genius is of each of the people that are currently in the business and getting each other to understand how to communicate with each other. And then doing a task audit on everything that gets done in the business right now. Then I get them to do their ideal day in three years time. So what's the ideal day for the business in three years time? Then work backwards from that in terms of what tasks will need to be done on a daily basis if you're living that. So if you say, we want to triple our revenue, we're going from 1 million to 3 million and we're going to have X amount of customers and we're going to have this platform. We go, okay, great. What are the daily tasks that need to be done to achieve that? And then we can work out a role architecture what roles will the business need to support that? Now we look at the current team. Oh, first, sorry. And then we look at the energies and the profile that's best suited to each of those jobs. And then we look at the current team and we go, okay, who's doing what now? What is inflow and what's out of flow? And what can they pick up along the way? But most importantly, what can they get rid of? Because too much founders are hanging on to shit that they shouldn't. And a lot of the time when I tell them to recruit, It's not about recruiting full-time staff right now. And half the time they can use virtual assistants and streamline their processes to get a lot of the stuff off the plate first and make sure they hire the right next person that's going to get them to the growth that they need to have. And sometimes we hire because it's the thing that we least want to do and we don't think about the consequences of that, about not having it being set up first. Because if we don't know how to do it, it's not in our genius. And we don't spend the time up front to make sure that we learn a little bit before we hire, we end up hiring the wrong person and it all falls down, then it becomes too hard, and then we get back on the wheel again. Yes. And you mentioned the relationship between personal brand and team culture and hiring. What are Mm -hmm. some of your thoughts around making your own workplace or your company an attractive place for a 
potential team members. Yeah. So if you think of all the unicorn businesses, right, and any of the fast growth startups, the difference between them and solopreneurs or small businesses is they've had a visible leader. They've had someone that is being able to set the vision and share that with enough people that people want to come on board, like even for free, right? If you are able to build your personal brand and share your vision and really get people along a journey, then the people, if you build it, they will come. So it's super important to think about all the ways that you show up in the world, that you're consciously creating it. You're like, if you're going to a networking event, you're thinking before you go, in three months time, I'm going to need a salesperson. And that salesperson could be at this event. How do I need to show up? And that's like image wise, that's communication wise, that I hate the term an elevator pitch, but for the sake of people understanding what I'm talking about, like how are you going to do your intro? How are you going to say what you do? So there should be a way that you do that that is visionary and storytelling that invites people to ask questions rather than, my name is Joe and I have a company that does X and we're accountants and we help Y. Like, <laughs> like, do you know I mean? If you're talking about, I help businesses to save time, free up cash flow and do it with ease so that they can have more impact on humanity, then people are like, what now? So a personal brand is everything. It's like how you show up all of the time. Most people think it's just like what your LinkedIn profile is or what your pictures look like online. It's not. It's how you show up in your team. So what's the character traits that you want to embody? What's the feeling you want people to leave a staff meeting with when they have it with you? When you interview someone, how are you perceived by that person? Because in interviews these days, the war for talent is real. So you are getting interviewed as much as you are interviewing them. So how are you dressed? How are you showing up? Are you on brand? What's your communication style? What's the message? What's the feeling? How are you going to roll them into your journey? Then are you showing up online in the same respect? So if someone actually goes looking, they're attracted to you. They're not repelled by your profile or they just think it's black. Like beige, moving on, next. There's just so many aspects to that. And that builds out as not only your personal brand to attract the clients and the partners and the investors, but that's how top quality talent is looking at you as an employer and an employer brand. I like that line. They're interviewing you as well. It's not just Mm -hmm. one way. I imagine the best people out there have options. So it's Uh just about who you want to bring into the business. Yeah. The best people out there are not looking for jobs. Yeah. They're not looking for jobs. They're definitely not trolling seek. They're not like, the only time you catch those is if they've been pissed off by their boss that day and they jump on and have a quick look, but then your ad better sing like to get them. But where an employer brand or your storytelling and you you stepping up as a visible leader happens, if you start really building a culture and making waves, then the people that are working at the competitors or that, they start taking notice. Like if you show up to be attractive, like you're showing up where they show up and they start seeing you, then they're like, what are you doing? And they might want to have a conversation with you. They don't even know why yet. Yeah. Before we wrap up, Jade, I wanted to ask you about your book as well. <laughs> Tell me about yeah. it. Is that Ignite Your Life for Women? Have I said the name? Yeah. You have, you have. Funny story. Public writing is my biggest fear. Paralyzing. So much so that I didn't even do my personal branding or promote the book until I was standing in line and at the airport and they were calling my name to get on the plane to fly to San Francisco to do the book launch. <laughs> my sister's like, dad is going to kill you. <laughs> like, oh my God, you're dead. I'm like, great. Yeah, so the Ignite Your Life for Women is actually 35 stories about your Ignite moment in life. And your Ignite moment is that turning point. And we have them, like we have multiple of them all through our life, right? But we had a couple of areas that they wanted to cover in the book. And that was like relationships, health, business, and consciousness. When we started talking, I spoke to the editor and they're like, we know that you have the stories and like all these different stories. And they teased out of me to go back to my childhood. And so my story is really from trailer and trauma to triumph. And what I love about the book is that you have a power quote. There's a story about like a backstory on the ignite moment. And it's what you did with that moment. It's not about getting down in the depths and staying in the wall of like how shit your life was. It's like, what was that moment that was the turning point? And then how did that help you get to where you are? And then we give an action step. So an actual step of 
what you can do to live a more exceptional life. So yeah, that's super cool. And what's even more cool is from, I actually coached the lady who created the series, JB Owen, and I coached her on her LinkedIn and personal branding. And then from going to the book launch and sort of working with her during that process, she actually invited me into the business. And I'm now the proud co-founder and driving force behind the Ignite Institute, which is by authors, for authors, with authors. And I'm going to be teaching all of my personal branding, my business accelerators, my how to build courses, how to have more of an income so that you can have more of an impact on the world for anyone who is an author. So that's my new side project. (laughs) Just to fit in with all your spare time. Yeah, heaps of spare time. Like we said today, no surfing today. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jade, it's been fantastic having you on the show. I really enjoyed our our chat. If our audience wanted to get in touch with you or work with you, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, the best way, as I said, LinkedIn is kind of my thing. So that's my social media of choice. You can find me on there just under Jade Green AU. So for Australia, AU. But that's my handle on everything. So if you want to connect with me on any social media, just Jade Green AU. My website is under construction, but it is businessengineered.com. The number one thing that I'm working on at the moment is that personal branding masterclass in Bali. And you can find out all of that on any of my socials. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Jade. It's been awesome. It has been awesome. Thank you. And I am just grateful for having to be on the show and connecting with you, Meryl. By the way, are you wanting support to get paid and make better decisions? We've put together a zero small business toolkit, including cash flow forecast templates and guides to setting up zero. Grab it for free at beingninjas.com slash zero toolkit. And that's X-E-R-O-T-O-O-L-K-I-T.